I, uh, I want to thank John and the, the organizers for the kind invitation to do this. All right, so I'm going to make the case against aggressive induction therapy for all younger patients with mantle cell lymphoma. And I guess I should start by saying that mantle cell lymphoma is getting like follicular lymphoma. <laughs> and what you're going to see is that I'm going to advocate for a more precision medicine approach. Uh, I think debating Brad about mantle cell lymphoma is clearly a challenge. Uh, There's somebody who's uh, made uh, seminal contributions in this disease and uh, th thinks about it uh, in a very uh, detailed and comprehensive way. Uh, in order to help disarm him, I'm going to show that uh, we do agree on something. We had our hearts broken twice. Uh, two years in a row by the Green Bay Packers, and, and speaking to a, a New York audience, of course, you don't feel sorry for us because we were playing in January when your teams weren't, but it still was very sad for us. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, historically, as Brad said, uh, mantle cell lymphoma was a disease that had a sh very short uh, overall survival. And, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago when we would say that chemoresponsive disease, yes, in fact, the response rates in mantle cell lymphoma are about as high as they are in follicular lymphoma to initial chemotherapy. The problem is recurrence, and the median survival was 30 months with CHOP-type chemotherapy. And the interest in aggressive therapy started in this era. And I think that really the argument I'm going to make is that since we're in a new era, the, the, it's appropriate for us to be asking the question again, how important is the uh, dose escalation? So this is the paper that I tried to sneak by Brad unsuccessfully. Um, I'm going to make a couple of other points about this uh, paper. So this is the same um, slide that, that Brad showed. Uh, for age less than 65, you can see here that um, you know, there are four groups. Uh, what Brad didn't mention is that 79% of the patients who are under age 65 are in these first two groups. So the vast majority of patients who are old, uh, younger than 65 are doing very, very well. And of course, I will certainly say that the treatment included autologous transplant for younger patients. So maybe Brad could conclude that the reason why these patients are doing well is because of the transplant. But the other figure in this paper was the group who was over the age of 65 where the patients didn't get transplanted. And you can see that still these top two groups are doing very well. Now the problem with the patients over the age of 65 is that they're more represented in these less favorable groups. But I think this begs the question in a historic way, not randomized or anything, how much was the transplant adding versus the question the younger patients are, are, are presenting with more favorable disease. And no matter what you do, they're going to do better, particularly in this era of novel therapies. Uh, Brad also mentioned that we have other tools to talk about disease heterogeneity. And there is this uh, proliferation signature that we might use if we were going to move to a precision medicine approach. Uh, and that there are groups of patients that can be defined um, that do better than others. So this is probably the most important slide for my argument. And the question is, what are the goals of treatment of mantle cell lymphoma? And what is the right endpoint when you're talking about truly impacting the patient? So all of us would acknowledge that the ultimate goal would be to change the natural history of the disease. And I think the way that you would do that would be to improve overall survival. Um, none of the studies looking at high-dose therapy have shown any significant impact on overall survival. And I'll say yet, but, but that's, that's the bottom line. So another goal of treatment could be remission. And I think Brad was making the point that uh, having seven-year progression-free survival is, is certainly an improvement over what we saw before. So remission um, certainly may make patients uh, feel better. Um, however, this is a disease, particularly in younger patients, where you can have active disease that is asymptomatic. And um, I'll show you some data in a few minutes from Cornell that showed you can even watch patients for a period of time with this disease, suggesting that it may not be so urgent to treat. And you may not make patients feel any better if they're asymptomatic uh, with just a low-level relapse. 
And the other is to improve quality of life. And certainly 15 years ago, when the option was more and more chemotherapy, the less frequently that you gave chemotherapy, I think the better. But I think now there are many non-chemotherapy options. And does avoiding chemotherapy matter when you might uh, run through the list that Brad described, where toxicity of those treatments uh, is at least a different equation? So when we look at data, we have to think of these issues. And this is really the crux of the points that I'm trying to make. So this was one of the initial studies that looked at uh, transplant uh, in this disease. Again, I'm trying to make the point about how things have changed. This was RCHOP versus CHOP, and you can see that, like Brad said, the median progression-free survival uh, at that era was only about two years. And when you looked at the transplant, the transplant was better, but even in the setting of transplant there, you were moving the median progression-free survival from two to maybe three or three and a half years. That's all the transplant gave you, but it was a victory at that time. Remember those numbers when we, when we move forward here. Uh, again, like all the other studies, at least to date, there's no difference in overall survival between these two approaches. So um, I want to emphasize that in these historic studies, the progression-free survival was very short compared to the contemporary studies, some of which Brad showed you. Um, and this has been the, the beginning of the efforts to escalate treatment. And if we look at what that escalation has accomplished, uh, Brad went through some of these studies, but um, if you look at uh, mainly TBI-containing regimens, including the Nordic study and some of the other studies, you can see that um, progression-free survival has improved dramatically over the period of time. And I'm not arguing with any of the numbers that Brad presented as far as what progression-free survivals you're able to obtain. And um, guidelines are suggesting this approach. Clearly, um, uh, consensus panels have been won over. The ESMO guidelines recommend an aggressive approach in younger patients, as do the NCCN guidelines, at least consideration of such. But what about non-aggressive options? And I would just argue that because most of the data supporting transplant, at least in a comparative way, was done back in 2005 and before, the question is now I think the world has changed. And you know, now that we have all these different options, we have to go back to that slide and say, what is transplant really doing for us? So this was the data from Cornell, and the reason I'm showing this, um, all this showed was that it was safe in a subset of patients to observe them at diagnosis. Um, and you know, Cornell doctors were very good at choosing who these patients were because when they looked at overall survival, those patients who were observed actually lived longer than the patients who needed uh, immediate treatment. The point to make here is that um, the overall survival here is much, much longer than what had historically been reported. And it suggests there's at least a subset of patients where you're not even treating right away, much less making a decision to escalate therapy to aggressive regimens like hyper CVAT or transplant. I think the BR has clearly made an improvement over RCHOP in this disease, and many people think this is a reasonable frontline treatment. And this difference isn't that different from what autologous transplant gave you when you added it to our CHOP as far as progression-free survival. And John's paper uh, and the, the group from Cornell looking at lenalidomide and rituximab, uh, I think one of the things to emphasize here is that these uh, patients were very balanced between low and high risk, clinical risk at least, uh, MIPI scores. Most of the uh, studies looking at the high-dose therapy consolidation have a predominance of patients with low-risk MIPI. It's because younger patients have low, lower-risk disease in general. It's not necessarily an intensive selection. But here, because patients uh, who are older could tolerate this treatment, you can see it's probably enriched for sicker patients coming in than the transplant studies. And that being said, you can see that um, you know, no matter what the MIPI score was, the progression-free survival looks very, very promising. Um, and certainly for the whole group, it looked very good. Now, Brad said that longer follow-up is essential, and that's clearly true, particularly if we wanted to look at overall survival and potentially the generation of resistance. But keep in mind, at recurrence, 
you, you have all kinds of options in these patients. You could come in with the Nordic regimen if you wanted to. It's very unlikely that these patients are gonna be beaten up to the point of not being able to tolerate that. So if there were a subset of patients who were resistant to such an initial approach, I think the, the door is wide open to all kinds of subsequent approaches, whether they're aggressive things like the platforms that Brad talked about, or CAR T cell therapies, or allogeneic transplant, or other non-intensive options. But the point is to start with, this is a pretty good start, and it's so much more promising than the platforms that, um, of RCHOP, certainly, which is what the autologous transplant was built upon, it really does give us pause, I think, to ask how important it is right now in a newly diagnosed patient to immediately start aggressively. <coughs> and here's the overall survival, just saying that these patients are, are doing very well. Um, Abrutinib is a very active drug, so in a, in a relapse setting, you could certainly uh, go with this, and you can see that um, it's not, uh, it doesn't last forever. Uh, Mitch Smith uh, just wrote a, uh, a piece about that, uh, saying that it's not a panacea, but it's certainly a, uh, a, an incremental improvement. And people are starting to look at uh, rational combinations, bringing some of these novel agents into less aggressive platforms. This was a recent publication looking at the bendamustine rituximab and abrutinib combination. Uh, it was in all patients with lymphoma, but a subset of patients that have mantle cell lymphoma. Some of them were previously untreated, a mix, but just sh showing the promise of how we might move forward with such rational combinations. So what is the value of aggressive uh, therapy for younger patients, reminding you that most younger patients have the most uh, favorable prognosis of patients with mantle cell lymphoma. So we know there's no survival benefit to the aggressive therapy, at least that's been demonstrated. And it's, there's really no clear evidence in my mind that it truly impacts those patients with the highest risk disease. Uh, the case that, that Brad presented at the end is a patient with clearly high risk disease, got an aggressive regimen, and you know, it didn't give you seven years of, of remission. Uh, there's no evidence in my mind that you're necessarily changing the natural history of the disease. This can be argued, but I think we need a proper randomized study to know for sure. Um, I don't know if this is gonna make patients feel better, uh, particularly when people are looking at maintenance options after transplant. So now the, the push in, in the aggressive regimens isn't to stop and give people a break, but it's to look at things like rituximab and other maintenance strategies post-transplant. It could increase to costs and toxicities. That's not a slam dunk because if you were to not give maintenance, an autologous transplant may be less expensive than prolonged lenalidomide, but we have to think about that as an option. And I would just throw out there that new options, some of which I mentioned on the slide, I think may further change the natural history of the disease and certainly provide strategies for novel combinations. And I'll just conclude with the thought process uh, being led by the ECOG group of where we might go in mantle cell lymphoma and just look at this phase three uh, part of this slide, um, suggesting that you know a, a reasonable question to ask in mantle cell lymphoma would be to take patients, no matter how they were treated, who were in a good remission, defined not only by PET scan but by minimal residual disease, and randomize them to transplant uh, versus no transplant. And if you were to do that, um, you could maybe definitively address the question. And I would suggest that we're gonna be successful at getting almost all patients to MRD negativity with some of our new platforms. I think it's gonna be a high bar for transplant to actually win in this scenario. So Brad, I think we should vote for uh, no for aggressive therapy for all younger patients using the precision medicine approach in this follicular-like disease. <laughs> and I'll conclude and say that um, baseline uh, biologically-based prognostic assessments may provide clues as to the small subset of patients who require or may benefit from aggressive induction regimens to be determined whether they actually do. I think response adapted treatment using MRD uh, is promising, and hopefully this will be the foundation of the next U.S. intergroup trial. Uh, novel low intensity induction regimens are likely to provide a non-toxic option to achieve MRD negativity for most patients. And without a demonstrated survival benefit, 
uh, we should feel comfortable at present individualizing the therapeutic approach and lower intensity options in my mind really should become part of guidelines at least as an option for patients considering how much better they are today than they were in 2005. Uh, I'll acknowledge my lymphoma team back in Rochester and thank you for this opportunity.